Am I allowed to join Sprocketeer? Is that something that's open to uh, HubSpot? Yeah, come on down. Cool. All right. I'm going to jump in there probably later today because uh, because that does look pretty awesome. Uh, well, folks, hope everyone is doing well today. Thank you all for joining this session. Of course, my name is Jack Cooper Smith. I am the Commerce Hub Go to Market and Onboarding Manager here at HubSpot. And I'm super, super excited to chat with you all about something that I imagine a lot of you all have been wondering about for quite some time, which is the international expansion of Commerce Hub. Uh, John Christophe, I see bonjour from Montreal. Great to see some folks outside of the United States here. I'm also just generally curious where you folks are in the world. So if you don't mind dropping in the chat where you're based, uh, I'd love to just get a temperature check as to how like, much of an international audience we do have here. So it looks like a lot of folks in Spain. I am jealous. I wish I was over there right now. Uh, awesome. So mostly outside of the US. That's great. That's great. Well, folks, again, thanks for joining here today. Really excited to be here. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Make sure everyone can see it. It is looking good. I'll kick things off by just uh, starting with a quick agenda with you all. I'm sure most of you all are wondering, like, when can I use it? So instead of just roll, uh, touching on the timeline at the very end of the session, folks, I'm going to lead with the timeline. So I do promise that is our next slide. I'll answer the question that I'm sure a lot of you all are uh, asking. I'll also touch on how Commerce Hub can help your organization. So some of the use cases that we're solving for and how we think about how the tools fit into the HubSpot platform. I want to spend most of the time digging into how the tools actually work. So we'll walk through a live demo. Folks, feel free to let me know throughout if you have any questions, especially during the demo. I'll keep an eye on the Q&A, but as Kyle mentioned up front, I do anticipate quite a few questions throughout this. So any questions that we don't get to live, we're absolutely going to tackle after the fact on that community page. Also, of course, happy to share this deck as well. Uh, and this recording will, of course, be uploaded online so for you to check out should you want to check it out later. But again, folks, definitely do feel free to drop in the Q&A. I have it up right now, and I'll keep my eye on it throughout the session. So I won't beat around the bush with you folks. I'll dig into where we actually stand on the timeline side of things. And I'm happy to say, folks, we are pretty darn close to being fully rolled out internationally. Taking a quick step back, we are not rolling Commerce Hub internationally out via uh, individual countries. So we're not starting in the U.S. and then doing Canada and then the U.K. and then Germany and then France. Rather, we're simply enabling the currencies that you use so that you can transact in your currency. Of course, USD is indeed supported. I'm happy to say that as of tomorrow, everybody on our EU data center will be rolled out and able to transact in Canadian dollar, GBP, and Euro. For everyone else, let's say you're in Australia, for example, I do imagine it's the middle of the night for you. Uh, so thanks for joining if you are uh, joining live, if not, and you're watching the recording. Uh, obviously, I hope you're doing well. We are going to be rolling out more currencies, Australian dollar and about 20 others in the next month or so, as well as local payment methods. So right now, if you are outside of the United States, you'll be able to use cards in your currency. We're going to be rolling out things like PADS, BAX, and SEPA uh, before the end of this quarter. Now, of course, these are approximate timelines. It's software development. Things can change, but we're feeling very good about the timeline here. So we are pretty much rolled out. Frankly, you all can get up and running with Commerce Hub during this session if you would like to. And for anyone who is not in the EU, for example, Canada or uh, the UK, hold tight. We're getting there very quickly. Now, I want to touch on how we're rolling out internationally, folks. And I kind of alluded to this when I mentioned that we're simply allowing for you to transact in the currencies that you transact in. I want to shine a light, though, as to really what is Commerce Hub? So Commerce Hub does not have, for example, a $100 a month cost. You all can roll out Commerce Hub, and it literally doesn't cost you anything unless and until you actually do transact. Now, instead of purchasing Commerce Hub the way that you purchase Marketing Hub, for example, you simply select a payment processor, an engine to power everything underneath the hood. We, of course, have had HubSpot payments for quite some time. This is currently only available in the United States and will remain available in the United States for the foreseeable future. This Stripe payment processing option is the mechanism that we're using in order to roll these tools out internationally. 
This is also what enables us to move as quickly as we're moving right now, because we don't have to go country by country. While I'm certainly not a lawyer, it's my understanding there's quite a bit of regulation that goes into payment processing, as I'm sure you all can imagine. So this is the mechanism that we're using to roll out internationally. And if you are in the United States and want to use HubSpot payments, you could certainly do so. If you can find a logo of the United States that doesn't have Alaska as big as it is right here, I'd also welcome that as well. So folks, we're using Stripe payment processing to roll out internationally. And if you don't currently have availability, you, do, you don't currently have the ability to use uh, the tools in your currency, give us just a couple more weeks or even 24 hours if you are uh, in, in the EU. So what are we actually solving for? Commerce Hub really is a is designed to streamline your opportunity to revenue process to allow for you to get paid faster, increase your revenue and save time. I'll double click into each of these here, folks, but just at a high level, I imagine a lot of you all are currently running your entire go to market operations through HubSpot, but you're jumping out of HubSpot to bill those exact same customers that you're managing within HubSpot. And then you come back into HubSpot in order to make them obviously as happy as you possibly can. And then they buy more products with you. You have to leave. Our whole vision is to bring together this commerce motion and this CRM motion so that you can have everything centralized in one place. I'd also argue that actually getting paid is amongst the most important parts of the entire customer journey. So we do want that to be as smooth and easy for you and for your buyers, for your customers as well. So how can we let you get paid faster? Folks, I'll move through these slides relatively quickly because I'd rather show you the tools in action as opposed to just pictures of them on a slide. But you're able to create a given invoice payment link or quote directly from HubSpot and send it right to your buyer. I'm sure a lot of you all have been in a circumstance where you're ready to close a deal, but you have to go reach out to your finance contact to send them an invoice. Then you wanna maybe follow up the next day. Hey, did you end up sending the invoice? Did they end up paying it? You're really losing momentum here at again, the most important part of the customer journey. Now you can create one of these artifacts from within HubSpot and immediately get paid. We also obviously want to let you all or enable you all to ideally increase your revenue and streamline your operations further. This can take a number of different forms. Of course, it can be moving from sending an invoice monthly to your customers to simply leaning into recurring payments. I'll definitely show you exactly what that looks like within HubSpot. We also have a high conversion rate on our checkout pages, and we are giving some uh, flexibility when it comes to HubSpot payments or Stripe payment processing. And finally, we would love nothing more than for you all to save some time, shut your computers early and get back to your friends and family. This will take a couple of different forms within our system. You can really lean into commerce automation. So things like following up on overdue invoices, renewal management, some of those items that seem extremely easy can be very difficult in a world where you have cobbled tools to manage your commerce process. We're of course centralizing your commerce and your customer data in one place to really give you comprehensive insights as to how your organization is progressing and where opportunities are. And then finally, on the accounting integration side of things, folks, you will not see HubSpot building an accounting system in the near future. Instead, we're really going to lean into integrations on this side of things as well. That will hopefully ensure that your finance team and your CFO remain extremely happy with Commerce Hub. Vrain, I'll just quickly pick up the question around importing historic data. We're very much thinking about that. Feel free to reach out directly if you do want just a little bit more insight, but uh, give us a couple more months, maybe a quarter or two more on that front, because it is something that we're thinking about. The last thing I want to shine a light on before jumping into the tools themselves, folks, is this whole concept of one plus one equaling three and really allowing for Commerce Hub to reinforce the rest of the HubSpot product. I think of Commerce Hub similar to Operations Hub in that very few people will use just Commerce Hub. Rather, it amplifies the rest of the tools. I won't read from the screen here, folks, but in a world where you have all of your commerce data centralized within HubSpot, you're able to do things like easily identify cross-sell and upsell opportunities to then serve them up to your customers. Your customer success reps on your team will be able to easily and in one place see what products did someone purchase? Do they owe you anything or is everything square? 
Of course, you can use webhooks to do things like provision or deprovision licenses when someone pays, for example, or if a payment fails, deprovision. So having this commerce motion within HubSpot, and this commerce data within HubSpot really does make the entire platform a lot more powerful, which is something I do want to call out because I imagine and I hope you all are getting quite a bit of value out of HubSpot already. With Commerce Hub, you'll be able to see even more value out of these tools. So I'd love to finally jump right in, show you all exactly how everything works. I also do, of course, want to show you all the difference between HubSpot payments and Stripe payment processing. As I imagine some of you all are wondering, like, what is the difference between the two? I'll show you the exact difference, folks, but just to answer that up front, there's virtually no difference at all within our system. The way that I think about Commerce Hub is these tools, which I'm about to show you, uh, will be populated from a given payment processor, and you simply select that engine to power these tools. Everything on the front end looks and feels the exact same. So, folks, what I want to run you all through within the app itself is first how to get paid with HubSpot. So the different options that you have with quotes, invoices, and payment links. I then want to walk you all through how this connects to the CRM. What does this actually look like? What can you do within HubSpot with this commerce data? And then finally, I want to show you all how you can use this commerce data with the power of HubSpot and not just view it, which in and of itself is very valuable, but we really do have some powerful pipes underneath the HubSpot platform that you really can start to leverage as you do lean into Commerce Hub. Now, again, folks, we do have very low barriers to entry for using these tools, and they are now available to, I imagine, the vast majority of you folks in this session here today. So if you wanted to literally follow along with me, go ahead and click on sales, payments, payments, connect your Stripe account or go through that HubSpot payments enrollment process. You can connect your Stripe account, folks. Right now it's 11.18 a.m. for me. If you wanted to go through this and be done by 11.20 a.m., you could. It really shouldn't take more than two minutes to simply connect. So if you all did want to pull up your account and walk through this with me, I would definitely encourage you to do so. So, folks, I'll quickly touch on quotes. I have this suspicion that a lot of you all are already familiar with quotes. So I'll move somewhat quickly through the quote creation process. Now, this is the same quotes tool that we all have known and loved for quite some time. Of course, when it comes to this bright green color, this will inherit from your account defaults as will the logo. So you won't generally, unless you all do use bright green colors for your business, you won't see these bright green colors on your quotes, but you can if you'd like, of course. This is the page where you really do need to spend just a couple of minutes thinking like, what is this person actually buying? I'll call out a couple of the things that we're working on folks and a couple of the things that we've delivered recently. First of all, in Rich, you kind of just put your finger on this in the Q&A here. We can indeed process one-time and recurring payments. So folks, if you wanted it to run monthly and have it be like your Netflix account, for example, where it just continues running until someone cancels, go ahead and leave a zero right here. If you wanted it to run monthly for 12 months, go ahead and just punch in 12 and it will run for exactly 12 months. When it comes to Rich, your question, I promise I did see that around daily and weekly increments. Not something that's immediately at the top of our roadmap to be completely transparent, uh, but it is something that we have gotten some feedback on. I'll, I'll make sure to log this feedback uh, because we will indeed build the things that people are asking us the most for. So we do want your feedback, folks. I'll call out a couple of other new features that I'm personally excited about. I hope you all are as well. You are now able to schedule subscriptions. So let's say you wanted to offer a 30 day free trial, for example, you could delay the start for 30 relative days, or if you wanted it to start on March 1st, you can simply tell us to start it on March 1st. The last thing I just want to shine a light on with you folks here is something that the team is heads down working on right now that we're actually slowly rolling out as we speak, which is payment schedules. Maybe you wanted to, and I'm not great at math, so I'll keep things easy. Maybe you wanted to collect a deposit of 50% and then 25% halfway through and 25% at the end, you can now configure that payment schedule, which will create invoices for those subsequent uh, payments that you can collect on. And of course, this will, this will surface on the quote as well. Got a little excited about some new features there. I want to show you all the actual connection though, between HubSpot, pay, uh, excuse me, Commerce Hub and Stripe payment processing. Folks, at the end, you literally just select Stripe 
Or if you're using HubSpot payments, select HubSpot payments. It adds a checkout button to your quote. I'm actually going to go ahead and take this full circle with you all so that you can see everything in action. Now, on average, this takes a business five tools to manage what I just showed you all right here. I think it really should just take like one. Definitely doesn't need to be too complicated. These tools are also not cheap. So we do hope that you all can consolidate your tech stack underneath our platform uh, and move I, maybe from five tools to just one. So if you haven't checked out our quotes yet, folks, definitely do so. You'll see that the connection to the commerce process is really that easy. Your buyer simply punches in their information and then that is it. Now, Mitch, uh, good call out around. If you do not have a Stripe account, you will indeed want to stand up that Stripe account. Shouldn't take very long at all, uh, but you can get started pretty quickly and then just plug it right into HubSpot. Now, folks, I am going to show you next payment links. So payment links is really the Swiss army knife of Commerce Hub. And these are used in a lot of different ways. I'll be completely honest. When we first built payment links, we thought people would just put it up on their website and then get paid really touchlessly without much back and forth with the given buyer of theirs. We were wrong. We're seeing a lot of people simply send payment links for quick and easy transactions. Now, folks, you all will notice your uh, pounds right here. You'll see when creating a given payment link, and I'll just walk through this with you all, you can select the currency that you'd like to transact in. This is what the international rollout looks like here, folks. I'll show you this in a couple of other places as well. When it comes to configuring the actual payment link, you'll see that it looks and feels quite similar to quotes. One of the things that HubSpot does an incredible job at, in my humble opinion, is user interface consistency across the board. So frankly, if you're comfortable in one place, you're likely going to be comfortable in every other place within HubSpot. And it's going to be the exact same thing with Commerce Hub. Of course, you can do one-time or recurring payments with payment links as well. Because of the fact, though, that these are designed to simply be placed on your website, there are a few differences between payment links and the other different channels, quotes, and invoices that we have. You can allow folks to create custom quantities. So let's say you're selling tickets to an event, $50 each, and someone selects five tickets, 250 is what the checkout will show. You can make line items optional. Instead of describing this too much, I'm just going to show you all what this looks like. And then finally, if we do have any nonprofits in here, I imagine you all are used to allowing your donors or your buyers to enter an amount that they want to pay and then pay that amount. That's exactly what this feature is right here, allowing people to set their own price. A few quick settings I want to spotlight as well, folks. You can customize this checkout page. I think we all know what discount codes are, so you can either enable or disable those. You can also collect any information you would like about a given person. So let's say you wanted to know their job title on checkout. You could certainly do so. The last thing that I want to show you folks here is you can redirect to another page. So let's say you are maybe uh, a SaaS app and you wanted to redirect someone to then set up their user profile after they pay. You can punch in the URL from right here and do exactly that. And folks, you will see that this checkout page will remain consistent. This is what the optional products looks like. So essentially it's upsells for you all. And payment links can be distributed in essentially the exact same way as meeting links, folks. So if you do want to grab that checkout and embed it on your page, go for it. If you wanted to come in and just copy the link and put it literally anywhere you want online, you can absolutely do so. The last thing that I'd encourage you all to think about when it comes to payment links is really thinking how you take your products and services to market online. Because we see a lot of folks using Commerce Hub to completely open up new revenue streams. So I imagine we have a lot of partners in this session. That's generally something that I've noticed. Uh, the easiest thing that anyone can sell is their time. Folks, you can connect. I'll show you this in a different account that I actually have my calendar connected to. Uh, you all can literally connect payment links to meeting links, and then you'll see that you can put a price on a meeting. You can connect payment links to forms, to CMS, to our email marketing editor. You'll see this really throughout HubSpot. So payment links, as you all continue, as you all think about your different options, I would highly encourage you all to think, how can we productize what we sell and put it online in a different way? 
because uh, I would love to see a world where you all open up completely new revenue streams uh, for your business. Deanna, Kyle, I'm talking a lot. Anything uh, stand out to you here? Any specific questions? I can run through some of these questions, but uh, any any major themes that you feel like I should jump on from the Q&A side of things? Or uh, have you seen folks use payment links in different ways out of curiosity? Uh, <clears throat> I just love payment links flexibility. How You can embed them in forms. You can embed them in uh, CTAs, I think you can do, uh, meetings, you can do, uh, I don't know all the emails, <laughs> like basically anywhere you would use a link in HubSpot, you don't have to like manually copy paste it. You can just select it from a drop down, and there it is, which is pretty great. Um, and then the ability to create them on the fly for a specific deal or something and just email them to, this is a meeting link just for you for this purpose right now, I think is, is really strong. Uh, there was a question earlier on about, um, I think there have been a couple questions that kind of touch on the differences between B2B and B2C. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone asked specifically, is it focused only on B2B scenario? That was that was Wesley. But then someone else was pointing out that in their B2B environment, you know, some of these purchases are tens of thousands of dollars and nobody's putting it on a credit card. So you, can you talk a little bit about the use cases you like the what's within the circle and what's without the circle <laughs> of how we see people using this? Uh, first of all, I agree that paying uh, you know, 2.9% on a $100,000 transaction uh, is definitely a lot. <laughs> folks, that's exactly why we are heads down on building these other payment methods for you folks, such as PADS, BACS, and SEPA. So essentially the ACH equivalents outside of the United States. That's something that I do expect to come full circle before the end of Q1. So stay tuned. You all will indeed see some more uh, information from us on that in the near future. I'll also just quickly show you all what this will look like. I, I, I know I showed before that you can transact in different currencies, uh, but you'll see in settings and then within the actual settings themselves, uh, like within the settings gear, you'll see uh, the ability to like enable those different methods. So you don't even have to surface cards to your buyers if you would like, if you don't want to. Now, when it comes to B2C versus B2B, we are seeing both folks really see value out of these tools. B2B in a lot of ways has been a sweet spot for a commerce hub. We see a lot of B2B businesses really haven't innovated on the commerce side of things or changed their commerce process at all since the 90s for a lot of folks is what I've noticed. Like the paper check is still very, very, very much alive. When it comes to the B2C side, one thing that we do not do right now is, is a classic cart functionality. So if you are looking for someone to, be able to go through, select a number of different products, have it go into a cart, do the abandoned cart emails, be able to manage your cart uh, on your end, like on the buyer's end, that is not something that we do right now. Frankly, nor is that at the very top of our roadmap. So we can play in almost every single space, but if you are looking for a classic like cart functionality, you'll probably want to look towards our Shopify integration or WooCommerce or BigCommerce integration, for example. All really good questions. One other thing I'll just note, folks, a lot of people think they need like a classic shopping cart and you don't really. So think about all of your different options. Uh, these tools are extraordinarily flexible. And I think also, uh, I mean, going back to the idea of a $100,000 purchase or something, if you are, this is your first toe in the water with e-commerce, it's probably not the place to start anyway. <laughs> I, you know, offer some paid consultations, offer some paid events or content or, or just play around, you know, what, what would you put behind a paid form or a paid meeting link if that was a function you had in HubSpot, right? And these could be experiments for you that produce nothing, or they could be new revenue streams for you, right? And that would be in addition to what you currently have. As you get your feet under you and get the system set up and figure out yes or no, this does work or does not work in this particular circumstance, then you can start rolling it out to maybe some, some of your core offerings that your business is currently relying on, but to just like completely unplug and upend all of your commerce collection efforts and tools and go all in on HubSpot payments would be a, a rocky road, not because of anything about commerce hub itself, but just because that would be kind of a crazy thing to do with your revenue stream. I'll, I'll add a couple of things. Uh, I've talked to so many businesses that are like, oh, I've always sold through a sales rep. There's no way I can ever change that. I'd respectfully push back on that notion, folks. I've seen divorce lawyers selling their services online touchlessly. Like, if they can do it, you can too. So I'd encourage you all to like break that frame of mind that I think a lot of us are in. Another thing that has resonated with me over the years, so our, our former chief product officer would always say, HubSpot builds software. 
We also build careers though. And so if you all in your business can be that person that opens up a completely new revenue stream uh, and be that hero internally, that puts a huge smile on my face and a huge smile on everyone's face here at HubSpot. So uh, I really encourage you all to think about those different options. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention clearly, I like talking about this topic, uh, more than 50% of buyers nowadays uh, and you know B2B decision makers are millennials. I personally fall into this generation and folks, I can tell you all, I don't want to talk to anybody when I buy things. And so meet your buyers where they want to be met. There's another element of that as well. So think about how you all can use payment links uh, creatively, folks. And again, it doesn't cost you a thing until someone actually transacts. Frankly, you're paying the rates that paying anyway right now. The last thing I want to touch on um, before going too deep down the B2B e-commerce route here is something that I've seen a decent amount of questions around uh, in the Q&A here, which is invoices. Now, folks, I'm sure this page looks really familiar to you. I promise I'll circle back to what we're looking at right here. I want to touch on invoices, though. There are a number of different ways that you can create invoices. You can convert quotes into invoices. You can also convert deals into invoices. You'll also see invoices. And again, I'll show you all of this on the right sidebar of contacts, companies, deals. And then finally, if you wanted to just create it from an index page, you could do so as well the way that I'm showing you right now. You'll see that you can enable or disable checkout. And then because this is an international focus right here, folks, you'll see that these are the different currencies that you can enable on this uh, specific invoice. And then per my comment earlier, where you all can enable or disable a given payment method, this is what it will look like right here. Now, folks, I'll quickly just show you all what this invoice will look like. And I'll also take it full circle so that you all can see absolutely everything. Again, I won't read from the screen here, but you all will see things that you probably expect to see about a given invoice. And then once this finalizes, if you wanted to send it directly to your buyer, you could do so. You can also simply come in, preview this invoice. I'll touch on a number of other things on this. Copy this link, send it directly to your buyer right here. And then you'll see this is a good old invoice that you can click into, pay it. And that is really it. It is that simple. We've gotten some questions about taxes coming in here, as I kind of anticipated. For right now, folks, your best bet will be to add taxes as a line item on your given invoices or quotes or payment links. Taxes is something that is indeed at the top of my team's roadmap. So automatic calculation is something we're thinking a lot about. For now, though, line item will be the way to go. Stay tuned, though, folks, because uh, we hear you and we're definitely thinking a lot about it. Uh, automatic tax calculation, especially when it comes to the VAT, uh, which I recognize is on just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of questions about invoices. Um, one person is saying they don't see invoices in their portal and wondering how to get access to it. Another person has been asking, can you use invoices if you aren't collecting payments through HubSpot? Can you just generate and send an invoice without a payment? Um, do you want to address those couple of things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in order to leverage invoices, folks, you will want to use Commerce Hub. And so go ahead, uh, if you're not seeing it, click on sales, payments, payments, connect your Stripe account, and you should see invoices pop up immediately, uh, actually. When it comes to using invoices and not actually processing with HubSpot payments or Stripe payment processing, go ahead and turn checkout off right here. And then you'll see, I'll just quickly show you all this in, in real time here. Uh, click around a little bit, you'll see that there's just no checkout page. That, that's that's it. So yes, you can indeed. I'll touch on a few things that you all may also be wondering as I walk through this. Recurring line items. This is something that is not currently available on invoices. It will be very shortly though, I promise you that. Uh, recurring invoices. So let's say you all, so uh, I always tie it back to my, my personal life. I had a storage unit for a while. The first of every month I received an invoice that I then paid. That's another thing that our team is heads down working on right now. A uh, couple of other nuances on invoices uh, that we want to keep working on. So we're not done yet. I can promise you folks that. Now, I want to do a little bit of a transition here, folks, and chat with you all about how this data is represented within the CRM. What happens after somebody pays and what can you do with that information? Because frankly, any company can build a good old invoice tool 
But being able to really bring your commerce and your CRM motions together and use the power of HubSpot is where Commerce Hub separates ourselves from other platforms in the market. I'll tie back to this interface because again, I'm sure that this is looking very familiar to you all. But the way that we're building this data into HubSpot is we are simply creating CRM objects, folks. That is it. So if it looks and feels like every other object index page that you've seen within HubSpot, well, it is like every other object index page that you've seen within HubSpot. Clicking into a given payment record, this represents a specific transaction. Now you'll see that you can fire full or partial refunds from here, fire receipts as well if you would like, they're sent automatically, but if someone asks for another one, you can certainly initiate that. You'll see things like gross amount, net amount, and fees on the payment object. You'll also see all of these associations that again, if you spent more than five minutes within HubSpot, I bet that this looks very, very familiar to you. I'll also call out folks, what's the difference between Stripe and HubSpot payments? I mentioned earlier, there's almost no difference whatsoever. You'll see that there's a processor property on the payment and the subscription object that stamps with HubSpot payments and Stripe. That's it. That's literally all folks. That is the difference between the two. I think I saw a question earlier in the Q&A. Are we going to allow for other processors, Adyen or Authorize.net, for example, to plug in here? Probably, but not imminently. Don't hold your breath on that, folks, but that is philosophically a direction that we do want to move in. So I would not be surprised if in the next few years we have a few other options on this dropdown, but that is literally the only difference between HubSpot payments and Stripe payment processing when it comes to how this manifests itself within HubSpot. I alluded to recurring payments a few times throughout this session here, folks. What happens when a recurring payment is run? you will see a subscription record created. This is both, this is an object index page here as well. Now this will hold slightly different data because it is a different object. This will hold things like next payment date, start date, end date, number of expected and completed payments, ARR, MRR. A lot of these things that you all may be like calculating manually or in a spreadsheet or with calculated properties, we're just gonna hand to you out of the box here. You'll see this processor property. You'll see in this case where eight completed payments into a uh, monthly subscription right here. So that's one subscription record and then eight payment records denoting those transactions right underneath that. Another thing that I wanna call out on subscriptions folks, this was a huge project for us last year, subscription management. I'd love to see a world where you go from dollars, let's or $25 in this case to $250. Let's say you got an upgrade right here. Go ahead and punch it right in. You can now prorate. This is a relatively new feature for us here as well. Save those changes, enter in some information, update the subscription, and boom, you just manage the subscription. You can also do things like change the next payment date if you would like. Now I showed you all earlier on the quote creation side of things that you can schedule subscriptions. So let's say you did schedule a subscription. The status will be scheduled. Let's say a given payment fails. So credit cards expire, for example. It'll be turned to unpaid automatically. Your buyer will be notified. You can also be notified as well. I'll tie back to that comment in just a few minutes here. But definitely keep an eye on this status for the subscription object specifically, folks. The last commerce object that I want to make sure that I mention is indeed invoices. I'm sure you all saw this coming considering that I flashed this page earlier. You all will see that we give you these out of the box filters as I'm sure you would expect. And then you'll see that you can click into a given invoice. Again, you'll see different information on this invoice because it is a different commerce object. You'll also see the ability to come in here. And again, I won't re read from the screen. For many years, I got a question like, can I manually mark a quote as paid? Not yet. You can indeed manually mark invoices as paid though. So we got that question earlier, like, can I use invoices but not transact on it? As of a couple of weeks ago, folks, not only can you mark it as paid, you can also actually record a payment record against the invoice. And so this is where you can come in, let's say it is a check, one, two, three, whatever right here, record the payment. You'll see that the invoice is marked as paid and a payment record was created and associated with that invoice. It's a very new feature for us that uh, I'm excited about. I, I hope others will uh, be excited as well. 
So folks, those are our commerce objects. Now, of course, you can view everything from this zoomed out perspective, the way that I'm showing you here. I imagine you all won't be shocked to see this, but you will, of course, also see all of those associations, the subscriptions, the payments, the invoices. All of this will look and feel just like everything else within HubSpot. So my hope, folks, is that you can get up and running with these tools extremely quickly and that the learning curve should be not much of a curve at all, ideally, because it looks and feels like everything else within the HubSpot platform. So those are our commerce objects, folks. Now, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions. I've seen, I've seen the letters APIs pop up a lot in this Q&A here. Uh, and I imagine a lot of this is coming from an angle of like, it looks and feels like every other objects and objects have APIs. So what's up with the commerce APIs? No APIs available yet, but I can tell you folks, as we look forward at 2024, this is one of those things that we're thinking a lot about. So stay tuned. Maybe we can do another session at some point around APIs because that will be a big moment. Also mentioned again, through the partner lens and, and something that I've alluded to a few times, uh, there's gonna be a lot of work to be done once we unlock APIs. I think there are about 500 things that we know people will want to do right now and 5,000 things that we don't yet know that people will want to do. Uh, so I'm really excited for that moment. I hope you all are too. And I think we're, there's gonna be a lot of work to be done in the HubSpot ecosystem to solve for our customers and the users of Commerce Hub. Now folks, I wanna be conscious of time. So I'll quickly mention a couple of other things that are really powerful within Commerce Hub and that separate us out from other competitive platforms on the commerce side of things. Now we could probably have a hug a week about workflows and be able to run that for quite some time. Workflows are, are of course a very robust tool without getting too deep into the weeds of workflows though, folks. Of course, the first thing is what is the center of gravity for a given workflow? So if someone wants to send emails after they submit a form, we'll contact submit form. So you would create a contact-based workflow. I'll show you all that you'll see subscription-based workflows right here to manage renewals, for example, or let's say a payment fails and you wanted to notify a given person. Couldn't be easier with a subscription-based workflow. Maybe a payment fails or a refund is fired and you want to notify someone. Create a payment-based workflow, call it a day from there. Maybe you want to follow up if someone has an overdue invoice. The amount of CFOs that I've connected with that spend hours a week going through spreadsheets and being like, oh, they didn't pay us a few weeks ago. We need to follow up with them. My hope is that you can use these tools, folks, to simply serve that up and make things so easy for your internal team, but also for your buyers as well. So really leaning into commerce automation, Commerce Hub unlocks this really unlike any other platform does. I'll touch on a few other quick things as well, folks. We of course have an out of the box dashboard called gross payment revenue. Now check that out if you haven't already. I also want to show you folks that these will fit into the custom report builder. Again, just like every, that sequence is not subscriptions, just like every other object. So you'll see that this fits in build whatever you would like, visualize that commerce and that customer data together. And then the last thing that I wanna show you folks here is that this is also data that's available and exposed within our list segmentation engine. So I got a question earlier in the Q and A, how does this tie back to CMS memberships? Well, if you wanted to create a list of your active subscribers, that's it, it really is that easy. And if someone's payment fails, they'll be removed from this list because the subscription is no longer active. And so folks, my hope is that as you all really think about your commerce process, you can consolidate your tech stack. You can bring that motion into HubSpot, bring down barriers between your front office and your back office teams, visualize all of your data holistically, and really be able to lean into the power of the HubSpot platform with workflows, custom reporting, list segmentation. So that's really all I have for you all on like the core content of today. I know we do have a lot of questions that come in. I'd of course be remiss if I didn't call out just a couple of calls to action though. Give the tools a try. Folks, I, we scratched the surface today. There are a number of things we definitely could have gotten quite a bit deeper into here today. But frankly, that was a 101 and a 102 and maybe even a 201 session. So give the tools a try, test it out. I'll also mention folks that we have a bunch of 
fake payment information. If you actually want to simulate things, don't try to buy anything with these numbers because it won't work. But if you do want to test things out, definitely check out this knowledge base article where you can do so. And folks, if you have feedback, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me on LinkedIn. My email is jakecoopersmith at hubspot.com. Feel free to reach out directly if you have any questions or feedback there, because uh, I'd love to connect and would love to help you folks out as you think about uh, your commerce tech stack and your commerce journey and how that fits into HubSpot. So folks, those are the main things that I had for you all. I'd love to open up the floor to any and all questions and any and all thoughts, Deanna, Kyle, that you all have as well. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, thanks so much, Jack. Uh, Deanna just dropped a, a survey in the chat. If you all want to give some feedback on this or on this session, we'd really appreciate it. Um, she's also dropped Jack's LinkedIn in there. I am dropping the link to this deck that you're looking at. If you want to review it, uh, share it, talk about it, you can take that with you. Um, one thing I saw popping up a little bit in the chat near the end there, Jack, was just questions again about timeline. So if you want to just pull the timeline slide up and leave that up while we go through the Q&A, um, I, think, I think that would be helpful. People just want to stare at that for a bit, and I don't blame them. Makes sense. Um, one clarifying question about this timeline slide I got when, when it was first up, uh, you said roll out to EU data centers and Canadian dollar euros and, and GBP. Um, do, can EU data center also do USD? Yes. Okay. Absolutely across the board. Uh, we also got a number of questions. We have some folks in uh, like Brazil. I think I saw Mexico. I got some questions uh, about Latin America rollout. That is going to fall under this bucket here as well, folks. So those more currencies right now, you all can use it in USD if you would like. But in order to transact in, for example, the Mexican peso, give us just like a month or so more. <laughs> um, and is there a, uh, someone asked if there's a, a list of currencies. I assume right now there's not because there's not much of a list to it. But as this expands, will there be a knowledge doc or do you want to just slack me so I can tell the world, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to throw parties for every new currency we add. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, don't hold me to this exact number, Kyle and team, but uh, 21 currencies is what I have in my head uh, rolling out before the end of the quarter. Uh, so yes, we'll definitely list that out for everyone. Um, so there are some nuances, like if you're, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to roll out to, you know, Iran or North Korea or Russia anytime soon. Um, but at a high level, we're going to be available in most markets. Got it. All right. Well, we have just 10 minutes left. Again, if we don't get to your question, the Q&A will be putting them on the community and, and sharing that out and getting through them all um, asynchronously. But if you all want to leave the chat and go over to the Q&A now and, and just look through and upvote the questions you would most like Jack to answer. Um, we're going to work most popular to least popular until we run out of time. Um, so here's that moment where I just wait a little and hope you're all upvoting. <laughs> uh, As people are upvoting, can I, can I uh, make the executive decision to take one of those questions that I saw a few times? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you so, are free to cherry pick. <laughs> cool. I'll, I'll do a little cherry picking here. So uh, I got some questions coming in around QuickBooks and accounting and, and how that fits in. Earlier in the session, folks, I mentioned like we're not going to be building an accounting system. Uh, so instead, we're going to be really leaning into integrations. QuickBooks is very, very popular in the United States. It's growing internationally as well. So I want to just quickly touch on QuickBooks. Uh, and where we stand today, and then take a step back with you folks and chat with you about where we're going within the next two or three months, hopefully shorter. As things stand right now, if you wanted to create a payment, there are a number of different ways to settle your books. If you wanted to create a payment-based workflow, and I know I'm building this out quickly here, folks, but I also get the sense a lot of you all have uh, probably used these tools a, a good amount. If you wanted to come in and say the payment succeeded, so essentially payment property equals succeeded, You'll then come in and you'll see, uh, sorry about that, folks. I'm actually going to show you this in a different account that has QuickBooks integrated. Sorry about that. Uh, you'll see a few QuickBooks workflow actions that we have, specifically creating uh, either paid invoices, or you'll see that you have the ability to create sales receipts within QuickBooks as well. So if you wanted to create a workflow that comes in and puts the expense on QuickBooks for the processing fees and then a sales receipt, you can do so can create another workflow. If it's refunded, create a refund receipt so that that feeds into QuickBooks as well. 
At a high level, though, we're going to be moving away from these workflow actions within the next couple of months. As I'm sure a lot of you all know, uh, we're really leaning into data sync as that engine that moves data between HubSpot and other platforms that you're using. So we are really working hard. And frankly, this is our number one priority as a team to bring the invoice and the payment object into that data sync engine so that you have invoice one, two, three that's open within HubSpot, invoice one, two, three within QuickBooks or Zero or NetSuite. When it's paid within HubSpot, it's marked as paid within those systems. And that is it. And so that's where we stand right now. I will say that accounting integrations are our number one priority as a team. I'll call out a couple of other quick things here, folks. You can always export your invoices. So we're never going to just hold your data and not let you access it. You can absolutely export your invoices. The last option that you have is you can jump into settings and you'll see the ability to come in right here and download these reconciliation reports. So a number of different ways that you can settle your books here, folks. Um, but I can tell you all, number one priority is accounting integration. So stay tuned for more on that front. Nice. All right. With that, <clears throat> I'm going to sort the Q&A by most voted. Um, up at the top with nine votes from Chris, who I think left. But for the other eight of you who are interested in this, uh, question for the end. Top advice for those having to show this stuff to operations or accounting teams and discuss overlap with them? Yeah, it's a really good question, Chris. So I'll take the operations team first. In my experience dealing with operations teams, operations teams are very much the folks who will see the entire picture of everything. I've had so many conversations with folks where they're like, you know what? My marketing engine needs some help. My sales engine could use a little bit of love and my customer success motion could probably use some help as well. I think when you think about things through the lens of those silos, it's really easy to miss the picture of that entire customer journey. And frankly, the commerce process underpins a huge amount of that. And so when talking to operations folks, I'd encourage you all to have the conversation around things like, what are we currently using? How many different tools do we have? How much does it cost? How well do they speak together? And are we really getting the most out of the data from the commerce side of things that we could be getting? I bet the answer will be, we're using five different tools. They're pretty expensive. That data is completely siloed in the back corner of the back office, and I have no idea what's going on with it. We can really address each of those. And I hope you all are leaving this session with at least a high level understanding as to how uh, that would be the case. When it comes to accounting teams and my, uh, my conversations with those folks, a lot of this commerce motion, again, as I mentioned to you earlier, has not changed this century. Like most people, 40% of B2B transactions, at least in the US, are still via paper check. So there's just a lot of room to grow. And I'd say the first thing is don't be afraid of change. We really can optimize the process. We've also found that accountants and finance folks, they don't love getting slacked or Microsoft teamed whatever that verb is, every day saying, did you send out that invoice? Did they pay it? So we're able to hopefully allow for your teams to be more independent while still feeding the data into the system that you need to be fed with the right data. Uh, and so my hope is that we can actually take work off, off of your plate uh, and still allow for you to have the confidence that the systems are getting populated with the information that they need to be populated with. It's a great question. I have a lot more I could say on that, but those are my quick thoughts. Great. Um, Jean-Michel wants to know, can you bring your own existing Stripe account or do you need to create a new one? You can indeed bring your own existing Stripe account. Amazing. Um, Silas asks about integrating with Zero. You mentioned that very briefly, but that's it sounds like that's on the data sync list. It is, it is. So, so that's my team's work uh, and we're really heads down on that. Zero is... Uh, at the top of our list, QuickBooks, Zero, NetSuite is, is where we'll prioritize in the immediate future. I expect that to come full circle within the next couple of months. I'm not sure if anyone here has gotten into the weeds of these accounting and of these accounting platforms APIs. I personally haven't, but it's my understanding that it's a huge project. Uh, so uh, we're working hard at it and we're pretty close to something that I'm personally very excited for. Cool. Joel... Uh, works in the tourism industry. I think I'm summarizing this correctly. Uh, I think the question is around being able to 
turn something into a payment plan and you can buy it one time or you can do three equal payments of whatever. Is that a thing we can, we can do? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I'll, I'll address that from a couple of angles. Let's say you are working with someone and you wanted to at like literally lay out it's 50% up front and then 25% halfway through our project and then 25% at the end. In that case, you're likely having some back and forth with this specific person and you would send them a, a quote. Let's say though that you just wanted to provide two options and uh, not have any conversation with anyone. You could create one payment link that is just one one-time payment or what you could do is maybe monthly and instead of renew until canceled for three months or what you could do. So this is what it would look like. Uh, I'll just quickly show you on the payment link. Wouldn't you know custom quantities are here. Another option that you have, so that's two payment links, maybe one button that takes you to the one-time payment, one button that takes you to three payments. You could also in theory, just make two optional line items if you wanted to. And so I'll just show you what this looks like. Have someone land on your checkout page and then select whatever they would like. Of course, you would do one time recurring right here. Not a perfect example because it's not exactly what you're referring to, but I hope that you all at least get the point. Okay, well, we are at time, I think. Um, lots of great questions here. Colton's asking about being able to have a payment link, you know, limit it to a number. Like we have 10 tickets for this event after we receive 10 payments turn off, uh, recurring payments with tax, discount codes, Discount codes are so fun. Um, we will get to all of these on the on the community uh, as soon as we can. Um, thank you all for being here, Jack. Thank you so much for making your time available. Um, we very well may take you up on your offer to bring you back sometime because it seems like people really like this event. Um, if you haven't already, go back to the chat, find uh, Deanna's pen, pinned message with the survey, give us feedback, um, how, how we could uh, make this better or if you loved it or, or whatever the case may be. Um, we are now at the top of the hour, so thanks everyone again for being here. We're going to shut it down, and we'll see you all next week, hopefully. Thank you folks so much. Bye. Bye.